Now, I would like to introduce our speaker for the day, Dr. Asif Anif. Dr. Anif completed MBBS from Ames Patna. He very recently cleared USMLE Step 1 with an excellent score of more than 240. He cleared the interview for recruitment into Indian Army Medical Corps held at Army Hospital, New Delhi in December 2021. He is well known for his sincerity and commitment to his work in the, in the college. With this very uh, brief intro, I would like to welcome our speaker for the day, Dr. Asif Nadi Anif. Welcome, Dr. Anif. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I am for having me here to give uh, to have given me this opportunity uh, to share my experiences and special thanks to Dr. Venkatesh sir as well uh, for uh, providing me this stage to uh, share my valuable experiences uh, for people who might benefit it. And uh, first of all, yeah, even though it's just only a quarter of the step, like uh, I have step two and step three. But still, uh, the initial step one, which is considered important by many. So I really uh, wish that many people can find uh, we find this session very beneficial. And I really forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Anif. So participants can uh, type their questions in the chat box, and we will answer them at the end. Uh, so starting with the session, I have collected a few questions already uh, from USMLE aspirants. Dr. Anif will be answering those one by one. And, uh, and the, at the end, he will be uh, answering the questions in the chat box. So is it uh, okay, Dr. Anif? Yeah, sure, definitely. Okay, okay. So uh, first I'd like to ask, why should one even think of going to US for higher studies? Asking the other way, what are the advantages of going to US? Uh, so uh, regarding this, so we'll put it this way. Uh, it's actually, there are different, uh, it's whatever pathway choose like uh, be it the indian pg or the uk system or the us system everything has its own pros and cons so it ultimately it boils down to one point what is your personal preference and what 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 do you expect in your life like what do you want to do with your life so like in my reason in my case like it was like i was more focused on academics as well i want to do something in academics as well so uh, when i researched about all the pathways after the mbbs then I realized that uh, like my, there is interest in clinicals as well. But in order to uh, do something in academics, uh, I thought that US was a perfect, the US training system was a perfect fit for me because it was a bit different from uh, what, what is being uh, done elsewhere. So I thought I wanted to give it a try. So it's also a curiosity thing. Okay. So and uh, how difficult is it to get into US compared to meet PG and black? Like, how difficult is the exams and system? Uh, so regarding the difficulty, uh, it can be actually uh, th those three exams that you said, NEED, PG, PLAB, and USMLE. Uh, they have the difficulty in the sense it's not just about the exam difficulty. So like from difficulty, what I see is that uh, you can, uh, from the point of st uh, starting of preparation till the admission date. So like if you look in that way, uh, these three are somewhat of the same difficulty. Why I say so is that because uh, each of them have different elements and they're balanced in such a way that almost almost the difficulty level is almost the same. Like for example, uh, I, like in, for the USMLE, you have to give three steps, and uh, basically it's the need PG. What it what it is actually uh, when you break up need PG into three steps, it's USMLE one two three. So like because USMLE one tests or you on clinical subjects and two on clinical subjects and step three is basically uh, case scenarios so it's basically need pg only but split into three parts and but the thing is that the catch is that need pg is highly competitive and it is an objective assessment which is uh, done in a three r format so in usmle you have uh, three exams three different exams so you have three chances so uh, the thing is that the difference where it comes is that the USML is a bit more longer and uh, there is there is a lot of financial requirements and you have letter of recommendations and the time frame, the opportunity cost, you will also have to consider in the opportunity cost as well. In NEET PG, it's in single exam, but the exam is very highly competitive. But in USML, even if you don't make up for the score, you still have other avenues for uh, developing your application. Uh, PLAB, somewhere, I believe that it lies in between because it has both objective assessment and a subjective assessment. So, that's what like uh, what I meant to say is that difficulty is almost the same. It's just that uh, in what areas these uh, exams focus on. So that's what matters. Okay. Yeah, very well explained. Uh, actually, yeah. my uh, next question is kind of related to the previous one. So okay. uh, preparation wise, what do you think uh, is the main difference? I, I, I understand that you already answered it, but would you like yeah. to throw some more clarity about the difference between these three exams, the uh, pattern of preparation? Like, uh, 
what is the significant differences between these three uh the significant difference is that uh, the question style like the question root question it's it's actually a bit different so uh, in neat like uh, neat pg what is that they expect you to have the entire medical knowledge and you will have to uh, sh- like you are being tested on the, all the medical subjects or all, all the medical subjects in a single 3 hour session so uh, so the questions are also a bit like the question routes are shorter in length because you will have to do it in 3 hours so the question route is a bit uh, sh- more shorter than usml usml is uh, a bit more uh, uh, there is a they provide clinical vignettes so they give clinical uh, scenarios and you will have to deduce the uh, deduce the answer that for that sole reason the usml uh, for neat you can only dedicate i think if i remember it right it's 1 minute per question or less but in usml you are getting a bit more than 1 minute for a question because the question routes are longer and uh, like, like i said in neat pg it's purely objective assessment but in usml it's both objective and there is subjective assessment why because you will have to perform in the interview as well because they conduct the interview so as to see your uh, uh, like whether you actually uh, possess the knowledge that you uh, that you uh, or say that you have and in plab like i said the plab it's almost it's just it comes in between like exactly it comes in between they have both clinical scenarios and they have small uh, small small questions where you have to uh, know a lot of factual uh, things as well um, yeah even it has a subjective part like i said the part 2 of plab you will have to it's the, it's uh, it's an oski like basically yeah, it's like our prof vivas like they will be provided with different work stations and you will have to uh, like you will have to fulfill whatever they have asked for in that flash card it will be a laminated sheet in every station and you will have to perform the task okay. so okay. preparation wise yeah preparation wise usml uh, like the materials are also different uh, so like when you look at the questions you will actually uh, realize like what should be done like what is the mode of preparation that you need so you will have to tailor your tailor yourself to the needs okay okay thank you very well explained anil so uh, next question i would like to ask is that how much would it cost in total for me from day one of my preparation to getting a job in the us because as you know uh, many are many, yeah. many from our country or from middle class background and they need yeah. to f- uh, plan their finances very well in advance also so this is a very important aspect that uh, everybody has uh, doubt in because this is the main reason where people uh, like have uh, like face a hurdle in uh, in planning whether to take usml or not the thing is that uh, like the expenses is actually very subject it's very highly variable from person to person why i say is that like uh, for a person with a green ca- a green card holder or a person who is having a relative in the us and or for a person who is having any people who they know from the medical fraternity who is presently working in the us uh, things get a bit more easier for them uh like why because uh, if you have a, a person in the medical fraternity uh, you can uh, you can uh, uh, arrange a medical like you have the communication with them like you have a point of contact over there which will make you able to communicate with more physicians for more opportunities and if you have a non medical like or any other non medical uh, relatives living in the us what happens is that uh, like we all know that uh, the us the highest cost goes for the accommodation so if you have somebody in the us like uh, your relatives you can stay over their house and uh, you will save a lot of money over there and that is a difference like uh, so like a person who is uh, first time going to the us obviously he'll have a lot of hurdles he'll have to have a lot of expenses in hand so the thing is that uh, you can consider anywhere like there are three steps you will have to do three months of us rotations and you will have to also uh, <clears throat> yeah and you will have to attend the interviews as well like uh, owing owing to covid right now the interviews are being virtual but uh, i'm not sure whether for the next season they'll do it the virtual as well but if it's not a virtual you will have to manage your traveling expenses for div- uh, from one interview spot to the other so uh, factoring in all these like uh, it can be somewhere around from 15000 to 20000 dollars which will come around uh, 15 lakh indian rupees but uh see like i said it's highly variable like depends on who like if you know people over there it will be much less and the main important aspect is that uh many of the expenses that you see that you can be minimized if you have someone to guide you well because mo- many of the decisions that we take like if we are less informed about the decisions we take for example if you're if you're uh, booking for a research or uh, research position and like in case if we have someone to tell us go through this way and go through that we'll save a lot of money by uh, like not filling up unwanted applications like we'll only give applications which we feel that we might we can get into so like a guidance thing is also like, that also matters like uh, who like if you have someone to guide you or not okay so how much uh, did you spend 
uh, from day one of the uh, preparation till clearing US yeah. MLE step one. So for me, it's it's around. I gave step one and I bought materials for step one. Yeah, and most importantly, the materials for uh, the US MLE steps are uh, a bit on the higher end. Like uh, considering. uh us indians so like because when you convert it the into uh, indian rupees from the dollars so it's a bit uh, on the higher end like for a question bank you will have to spend around 40 uh, for 470 480 dollars that's like uh, 30 40000 rupees so for me up till date i gave step 1 and i have given by what materials for step 2 so it's, it's around uh 2 lakh around it's been almost 2 lakh for me right at this moment maybe more oh. but not less Okay, okay. And uh, you were telling about the materials are costly, all those kind of stuff. Yeah. Materials exactly? Did you use for the exams? Be it both books as well as online resources. What materials one should must have and uh, which are good to have? Yeah. So the thing about USML step one is that, uh, like, uh, the principle like. 80% of the uh, questions are from 20% of the topics so that principle stays valid for usml step 1 as far as in like in my experience so the thing is that uh, rather than going cover to cover uh, of all the like basic subjects for example usml step 1 covers pharma physio micro pharma uh, uh, first in the second year subjects like rather than going cover to cover of all the books it's but like it or oh, definitely it will help if you have a good uh, foundation knowledge definitely it will help but it's uh, it's better to uh, like uh, follow uh, like the core the core of resources like it's considered gold standard for the us uh, usmle so it's abbreviated as ufap ufap people call it ufap so it's actually u world first aid and pathoma uh, so u world is definitely the gold standard and uh, you can supplement it with first aid and pathoma like in case if you are not if you are still lacking in basics you can definitely supplement your knowledge with boards and beyond boards and beyond is more or like less like uh, videos where they give lectures powerpoint presentations with adequate explanations so it's more of more or less tracking first aid like it will help you track first aid very well the main catch over here is that uh, like it's the actual usml preparation is actually divided in two phases like this is what the uh, many of the uh, students do one is a pre dedicated phase and a dedicated phase the pre dedicated fa- base uh, phase is when you develop your uh, clinical roots like the knowledge basic clinical knowledge all the basics that you, that i told you so in this phase you can use uh, resources like kaplan boards and beyond i have i personally haven't used kaplan but i have used boards and beyond i can say that it's actually a really good tool for uh, developing uh, the to use in the pre dedicated phase but once you're in the dedicated phase it's always you world and uh, you should put yourself entirely into it and in ufap ufap is the one which is recommended and tested since many years for the dedicated phase okay okay and uh, you spoke about different phases of preparation and all so yeah. uh, let's deep uh, let's explore further uh, what are the study strategies you followed when preparing can you brief yeah, about it uh, so yeah so my study uh, planning was a bit uh, untrad- non traditional uh, like what i like like i said contrary to what i said uh, pre dedicated dedicated actually i started with dedicated itself because uh, i made up my mind very f- quickly during after my internships so i had to go into dedicated so i thought of giving the exams earlier on but then i started with ul because since i was just come freshly out from my ma- medical college after my uh, profs and all so i had some 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 uh, more or less the, some of the basics in my mind so it was a bit difficult to start at first but once you get into track then it's like uh, like what i say like when you start off with the ul you don't make much progresses but uh, later on like what happens is that you gradually catch up so my strategy is not the ideal one uh my strategy what i followed was i directly jumped into dedicated phase then i started with u world and when i got stuck in u world what i did was like uh for then i realized that my roots were a bit lacking so at meanwhile i took bnb what's and beyond it's abbreviated as bnb and i watched some videos and uh, like what i said i gained some confidence then i went back into u world again so first aid i reserved it for the last uh, many people do the other, do it the other way around but i felt a bit uncomfortable in first aid doing it first so what i did was i did u uh, world supplemented with uh, boards and beyond and definitely i should never forget this thing it's sketchy micro sketchy micro is basically uh, it makes life much easier for people who are having a hard time with micro 
so for microbiology sketchy micro is actually which it will give you a medi- picture in your mind so which will help you in the exams as well Now, ultimately you don't even need to revise it because you remember the picture so sketchy micro boards and beyond supplement like sup- they are use a supplement to the main resources you will definitely so that's what i did but not the ideal one but this is what i did okay uh, that's interesting uh, i would like to know you uh, use these many resources and all but uh, would you like to able to uh, give a time frame like i use this material for these many days so like can you give some time frame yeah uh, it's always advisable to actually uh, make a schedule for yourself because the usml step 1 and step 2 what is what is the uh, the catch point is that uh, you will have you can decide your own dates like you can decide when do you want to give the exam so unless and until you come up with a timetable proper timetable uh, you will always tend to procrastinate and that has been happening with almost every student who are preparing for step 1 because like uh, like if you get get up with a proper plan if you have a proper plan you will have, you will have to finish this much topics within these days only then you will have a, a like a goal otherwise uh, the, the 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 exam day will get delayed for sure the thing is that you world requires in mm-hmm. like uh, much like it needs attention like you need much more time into your world because you can't just rush through your world so you need like it's better not to count the days when you do your world but make count of days while doing the supplemental resources like for example boards and beyond uh, make make days count because like because they are just basically supplemental resources uh, so like make uh, specific days for example what i did was uh, i made sure that in like if i wake up today uh, by before to, tomorrow evening i'll be i'll be done with all the gat videos twice so similar examples so like i made short term goals like what i did, what i did, in my case what it worked was like whenever i make long term goals it doesn't work out so like what i believe is that making short term goals short term goals in the sense a week for a week make goals for a week make sure you complete it or less a week or less not more than that the because the longer uh, goals you make the longer the, the more you tend to make it more flexible and yeah it will become deranged so that's what i did like i never uh, counted my time when i was doing u world but i did put put a tab on time when i did sketchy and the other supplemental resources like i said boards and beyond and atoma okay okay and uh, do you recommend working as a jr in some hospital during the preparation phase yeah so uh, like i said uh, there is two phases pre dedication and dedication so actually definitely working as a, a doctor when you see cases when you learn like when you uh, see the cases you learn it will definitely add to your memory and it's it's like that that is the type of knowledge that we need actually in ideal case situation so like uh, for example uh, if you're preparing for step 2 you can definitely in a pre dedicated you can it will actually uh, it, it will work but once you're dedicated it is not recommended to uh, have some deviations like i said even though this is the ideal case scenario most people tend to tweak this a little bit because of their needs like uh, for example uh, i am in my dedicated but i am still working as a jr so like yeah it's actually subjective but in ideal, uh, ideal case scenario what is recommended is that like if you are in a dedicated period just focus on what you are doing right now and in pre dedicated you can uh, work as a jr and work on your uh, foundational concepts uh, in the mean mean time so yeah that's what i think would be the ideal case ideal case okay so what do you uh, advise for people who are uh, working as a jr even in their dedicated phase just for the sake of uh, uh what to say earn money so that they can spend it for the exams so do you think uh working for just the monetary benefit is uh is advisable uh so yeah like i said so uh, it depends on person to person like it depends on the need of the person like if if the person is really in need and uh, he needs uh, some financial support definitely he he like he will be going for work so that he needs it and working as a jr it also depends on like how you divide your time like uh, ultimately uh, work with study if someone can balance it very well if you can find uh, the time to study while you're working then that's uh, that's absolutely great but uh, still i would say that uh, it's uh, it's less recommended to do a job in dedicated phase because it will definitely what you need is that like uh, this is a 9 hour exam and an 8 hour exam so you need to practice all those lengthy day exams before your uh, actual exam day and you will have to uh, like what to say free your mind from all the distractions because 9 uh, hour exams and 8 hour exams are not a walk in the park so they require dedication so like at least the, uh, for some few days before the exam like a couple of weeks before the exam i would say that uh, take a break from 
whatever uh, work you're doing and at least like two weeks before the exam just make your mind fresh and go all in for this preparation phase if you're if you have no other choice than to work okay very well explained Manish. and uh, next question i would like to answer ask what all did you do to build your cv so if suppose i am a uh, after seeing this webinar i'm interested to uh, give usmle what all should i do in order to make my cv stronger and uh, cv more attractive so that i'll get better opportunities in us starting yeah. from day one from today uh, so regarding cv it's actually a bit tricky uh, because uh, cv comes in a different way like uh, what what happened with me was i hadn't made my mind like whether to go for uh, usmle or not during my medical school days so what i did was i only fixed my mind after my internship but somewhat lucky for me i had been actively involved in all the events that has been happening in the college actually and uh luckily i had some things in my uh, account so like i was the organizer for the my events in college because i wanted to do something in college i want I, i like i'm a person like who is who gets bored sitting idle so i did something so ultimately it worked out but for pers- people who have made up their mind in their med school itself i would highly recommend them to build a cv like there are different ways of building a cv for example like uh, if it, it's not necessary that you will have to do what the other person has if you look at another person cv it's not necessary that you should have those same like uh, for example if you are in first year or second year you can volunteer for the icmr sts so that you can have an exposure and you can get involved in research projects and definitely you can go for a volunteering like in her by in form of health camps uh, blood donation campaigns and uh, immune awareness programs all these things actually like they do really count and you can do uh, what to say there are like there are a lot of op- uh, opportunities that you can do uh, you have to improve your cv so cv as such uh, i guess that yeah like i said it it will, it will depend from uh, what what the person actually wants in a cv and for example like if you're matching into a highly uh, re- competitive program like orthopedics or dermatology you will need cv somewhere in your cv so like it's it's highly advisable to start with some projects from earlier on in the med school itself and finding a good mentor all this actually matters okay okay and uh, you were also mentioning about icmr sts i think currently the applications are open so yeah. even uh, many were uh, inquiring about uh, how to choose a guide how to choose mm-hmm. the topic yeah, yeah and uh, i know you will be aware that uh, on this sunday february 6 uh, sunday evening 6 pm we are having an orientation session for uh, icmr sts as well yeah, so yeah, i think to see that yeah. yeah i think that will be more beneficial if attended yeah definitely yeah i would highly recommend people to actually if they are if they want their cv to be strong obviously what you can do is that research is the thing which will always like it will always benefit you like it will always follow you like if you have a paper published in name it will stay with you for lifetime like for lo- like you have something in your name so act- that actually it does matter so yeah okay thank you and uh, you were telling that uh, the cost depends upon whether we have some known people in us and all yeah. so does that mean that uh, if i don't know someone in us it is going to be extremely difficult for me to get into us Uh, so like i would say that the prime example is myself so like i don't have uh, like no uh, i have don't have a specific person in the us but still i am uh, going for it because it ultimately it all boils down to one point like are you like dedicated like do you really want to do it do you have to do it so like if you decide that you need to do something and you want something i don't think that uh, someone in the us whether you have or not should never be an obstacle for you because like if you are dedicatedly into something there will be people to help you out and there will be a way out so for example like i said if you have people in the us it it does not guarantee you a seat though like it does not guarantee you a, a residency spot like it only cuts your cost and makes your pathway easier that's all so like for you to match into a program you will have to perform in the interview give your uh, get uh, decent step scores and work on your cv so that cannot be bypassed like even for a for a specialty spot like for a spot so like having a person in the us will is actually gives you an upper hand but not a guaranteed spot so that should never be an obstacle for people who really want to pursue their uh, career over there okay okay i think that your words should give a lot of confidence to people who are thinking about this question okay yeah so, i am really glad yeah i was i got the opportunity to uh, 
share this share my experiences and yeah the ultimate thing is that like uh, if you have someone to guide you properly i don't think usml is usml is actually perceived as a very uh, undoable exam undo because of the uh, like long pathways long wait times and all but it's actually doable provided that you have a person uh, who can guide you walk you through or uh, like these sessions and all like if you the con- these sessions if people who are watching this uh, for the people who are actually pre- in the preparation phase it'll add to a moral boost and like i there will be a lot of people who needs that uh, misconception to be cleared off like usml is not an undoable exam like it's still doable but it all matters on whether you have the determination to do it and whether you are willing to put in the work or not okay yes absolutely and uh, moving on to our next question many students are worried about the visa process what do you think about it how difficult is it to get a visa for uh, uh, usml and uh, for settling there okay so uh, i would like to be uh, frank over here like at this current situation we all know that of the uh, covid situation the micron situation the present upcoming waves and all so uh, it is an issue at this moment at the moment uh, getting a visa has been a task because like obviously uh, they have this uh, increasing rapidly increasing number of covid cases so they're actually uh, the embassies are not entertaining any visa applications so at this point of time uh, it's it's actually become uh, a bit of a task but still there is still a way a way uh, that you can actually make use of it like if you don't get a visa like uh, visa is just for like doing the matching like uh, when you get a residency spot you need a visa but for doing clinical rotations you need a visa that is when the issue arises like for doing clinical rotations you need a b1 visa to go over there and uh, to do rotations but that is where the issue arises like you won't be getting uh, like it's difficult getting a appointment for a date for that b1 visa uh, so like what we are going for that we are actually going for us for clinical rotations that's what we need at this moment like who have given step one or step two prior to the match uh the what what we can do is that make use of this time by giving tele rotations there is a new thing called tele rotations so what happens is that people instead of going in person rotations they can gain clinical experience by see, at the comfort of their home in front of a laptop so basically we'll get clinical exposure from uh basically uh, through virtual like do to adv- like the technology which we have so the main point is that you also get a letter of recommendation after you do a let- uh, tele rotation and it will save you a lot of uh, visa cost travel expenses everything so like i said for every problem there is a solution if you if you're willing to find a way out of it okay very well said and um, how many years should i stay back in the us before returning to india i like what are the minimum years uh, before which if i return to india uh, going to us could not be of any benefit uh, yeah actually i think it's the other way around uh, the thing is that uh, you can stay in the us there are two types of visas like uh, th- in fact three types which we should be aware of as uh, residency applicants so there is b1 and b2 and b1 and b2 are the visa types which is used for clinical rotations like like i said when you have to go for clinical rotations for a brief period for example 3 or 4 months you need a b1 visa so you cannot stay in the us more than 6 months with this b1 b2 visa so uh, what happens is that uh, like that is the thing which i said like uh, the visa issue getting an appointment has been difficult for these things this is just for the temporary basis like for getting into when you get into residency spot there are two types of visa options that you uh, should be aware of one is j1 and then h1b and h1b uh, is actually uh, the visa in, like uh, when you do h1b uh, like both of them are basically used for do, uh, like used by many people who are taking up residency spots the thing about h1b is that uh, you you don't need to go back to uh, to your home country to show your roots so like what happens in j1 is that when you take a j1 and uh, after j1 is basically exchange visitor visa like if i am if i am saying it right i think it's exchange of visitor so what they expect is that your training period they'll give you a training period of 6 to 7 years that is a typical training period after that period you will have to go to your home country to show your commitment to your home country and your roots and you will have to work in your home country for at least 2 years only after which you can come to the us and apply for a green card or uh, further thing whatever is needed but and uh, in h1b there is uh nothing like that you can actually after your residency you can apply for a uh, uh, like green card this right away uh but see like i said there are pros and cons for everything 
so the in j1 visa like there is like even though i said that you'll have to return to your home country there is a specific thing known as a waiver j1 waiver thing so what happens is that uh, a waiver in the sense a waiver job waiver job means basically uh, you are actually finding a way out uh, to bypass the two year home country service what is what can be done is that you can apply and give an application uh, what happens is that there la- there are certain federal agencies the us federal agencies they'll uh, they'll post you in certain areas where there is acute need of ph- where there is an acute need of physicians and you will have to uh, serve over there for at least 3 or 2 or 3 years and then you will you don't have to come to your home country to show your dedication and roots so basically that's what h1 is and uh, in h1b there is no such issues like you can after your residency spot you can directly go for a green card application or whatever other applic- uh, like uh, whatever other things that you need to do and the thing is that um, there is another catch on this point is that uh, in j1 visa you are like for fellowships like after the residency when you go for fellowships having a j1 visa actually adds adds to the benefit like they most of the people are willing to uh, like it's more friendly to j1 like j1 uh, people with j1 have a more chance of getting into fellowships because they offer j1 more than h1 so when you take into the factor the fellowship thing uh, j1 actually matters okay. j1 actually has an added advantage advantage okay thank you for explaining so after all these processes after so many hardships oh, i am getting into usmle and getting my first job what will be my entry level pay okay uh, so uh, this is also a tricky question the thing is that um, before uh, like getting into the uh, pay we'll have to factor in one important thing like uh, when we see a pay like before converting it to indian rupees like whatever they pay if before converting indian rupees what we have to fact we have to factor in the fact that uh, the daily expenses over there so like uh, the average resident salary ranges anywhere but i'm just saying a rough estimate from uh, 55000 to 70000 per annum so that is like when you convert it to indian currency it's quite a decent amount but when you factor in the uh, live, daily living expenses over there like even the daily groceries like the tra- transit mode of tra- transit expenses the food it will actually for even a basic meal it will cost twice or thrice more than what is actually uh, what actually cost over here so we'll have to take that into account so but still it's 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 a it's a decent amount uh, for to sustain one or two people one or two persons and uh, yeah and the pay also varies from region to region like for example if uh, if you are uh, being uh, if you are resident in uh, top tier city where the expenses are high uh, your uh, pay will obviously be proportionately high but the average range lies anywhere between 55000 to 70000 dollars per annum okay, okay or maybe more this is just a rough estimate it will be around this range okay uh, thanks for answering these questions patiently i would like to uh, ask uh, currently how we are preparing for step 2 okay uh, step 2 yeah step 2 like uh, the thing with step 1 is that you have a lot of resources that is why you tend to deviate so that's what happened with me as well i think i forgot to mention this when you are preparing for step 1 you need to be focused like that is why i said it's ufap for the dedicated period and the pre dedicated go for some resources the thing is that uh, yeah there are there is another question bank called ambos which many people say it works for them but i haven't personally tried it out so i uh, like i'm not in a position to say about it uh, so the thing is that uh like i said uh, for step 1 you have plenty of resources like a plenty of uh, resources to think about but in step 2 it's the other way around you have very few resources so you will actually uh, you have no other choice than to do u world and u world is actually more than sufficient uh, from what i have um, like about i have research from my research i see that u world is actually more than enough and it can be supplemented with online medded uh so it's basically a video like they'll give you videos on certain topics like it's just, just like bots and beyond and yeah it's actually step 2 it's more like it's you world you world you world that that's what people say so people say that uh, you world is more than uh, sufficient and i'll have to see it for myself whether it's actually true or not so yeah okay. step 2 you have less deviations all the best uh, for your preparation of tanif thank you and so thank much. you so much for the uh, excellent session hope the knowledge gained from this webinar will be of immense help to the junior doctors especially those who always wondered about how to get into the united states thanks a lot for your time despite your hectic duties so we are coming to the far end of the session uh, before that let us take few questions from the audience 
audience yeah, sure. please start typing the questions uh, meanwhile i would also like to invite you for our upcoming ima jdn events tomorrow at 7 pm we have a session about cancer awareness where we have eminent oncologists across the country to talk on the occasion of world cancer day following that on sunday at 6 pm we have an orientation session to icmr sts that is short term studentship uh, where experts will be answering the frequently asked questions on the short term studentship project you can find the registration links for these events in ima junior doctors network facebook page instagram instagram page and as well as in my personal profile as well so coming back uh, let us uh, check the ch chat box for the questions we do have a few questions uh, from the audience so first question is by uh, dr ravi kumar uh, what are the challenges you face in your journey uh, so the like i said the challenge is that uh, like uh, may very few people uh, take up this journey so the thing is that uh, you, you you always need a support system with you so like be it your peer study peer group or your parents or like if you find a support system and make sure that you always have that uh, someone to push you harder because not every day is your best day at times you might feel a bit down or low or you might feel like giving up and it's better to like stay motivated like you will have to stay focused so persistence is the key like uh, whatever you aim for like in my personal experience what i experienced was that persistence is key the more persistent you are like the more persistent you are the more likely you are to uh, achieve what you need so what the challenges like like i said so it's it's easy to give up but it's difficult to stay persistent okay and dr lalit kumar has asked uh, what happens when the results become pass or fail so yeah so the step one has been transition to pass or fail from january 26 uh, the thing is that what happens is that it's it actually uh, in a way it helps but in, in terms of img perspective uh, it will uh, it will make uh, like actually what we are we are actually we have to prove ourselves in a better way like what happened is that like uh, imgs tend to have a good scores in uh, step one because it was an objective assessment so like uh, step one what after it becomes pass or fail what happens is that the more emphasis will go to obviously step two scores because like the, there are only two objective uh, assessment uh, objective ways of assessing left that is step two and step three so like uh, other apart from that it also gives you an opportunity to work into the cv like uh, to get involved in research projects to find good lors like uh, i think i have mentioned it the main core part of an application to the us mle that is the eras like we submitted in eras uh, the main core part is the letter of recommendations so how do you get this letter of recommendations like from doing clinical rotations in the us that is what i said and uh, like that those actually matter so like when this becomes pass or fail uh, the advantage is that people have less burden on the scores and people will what uh, even imgs as well they'll focus more on the research aspect and clinical subjects more and they'll work on their cv such that their application becomes uh, when you look at the application as a whole it actually it actually will add benefit like add to the benefits like it will uh, it will push the img applicants harder and i think that it is mainly it was mainly uh, done to like what to say recruit uh, like qualified applicants or uh, quality applicants okay okay uh, thank you for answering and dr uh, priyanka ishwarbai has asked uh, as a medical student uh, when should i start preparing for us assembly step 1 Ah, so there is no specific time frame from when you can start like i said i started from late internship and there are people who have started from first year second year of medical college all it matters is are you like uh, do you want to like first of all it's it's important to decide why do you want us and like stick to it like why do you want to do us mle and it's always preferred to take some time over it like it's like uh, like just looking at artificially the lifestyle and all those things jumping into the conclusion is not recommended so like don't act prematurely but take your time sit think discuss with your parents or friends the pros and cons what do you need in life and uh, whether it's possible or not and plan ahead and make a decision like it doesn't matter which which part of medical school that a uh, medical college that you make this decision but when you make a decision make sure that you stick to it and there is no turning back so that like you will have to be focused right so yeah it actually phase doesn't matter unless and until like if you're ready and you're okay with it go for it at any time doesn't matter post graduate like doing your medical school doesn't matter okay okay 
Dr. Vaishak has asked, do we need extra coaching to prepare for USMLE or can we prepare on our own? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, you can uh, prepare on your own. Like, uh, from most of the friends, my friends, myself, from all the people that I've seen, I've met on Telegram, I've met on Reddit, I've met on uh, WhatsApp, all those people, whoever I met, everybody has been doing self-coaching. Because the thing is that the resources which we have to study, it's actually, uh, what to say, it's it's more it's self sufficient like it's self-explanatory. Uh, the resources are well written in such a way and be it boards and beyond or be it you old or be it first aid. It's it's actually more than self, like it's self-explanatory and you can understand it when you go through it. Like if you are reading it, you will definitely uh, understand it. I don't think there is any need for any artificial help unless and until you are sure that you need somebody for sure, then you can go for it. But otherwise, I don't think it's essential. Like you can do it by yourself, no doubt, because I've seen people and myself, I'm an example. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim has asked, uh, will you get into residency if you fail in your medical school? So, will your pass or fail and uh, uh, a number of attempts matter when it comes to SMB? Okay. Uh, so the thing is that uh, I think I did not mention this. So like uh, in the ERAS application, ERAS application is basically the final application which you send for like for people to send you interviews. It includes your uh, CV, uh, personal statement, and personal assessment. Why do you want to? Why do you want to do uh, this uh, specific department? Like uh, for example, if I'm taking general surgery, why do you want general surgery? And like you'll have to in, uh, include a personal statement, a CV. Uh, minimum of three letter of recommendations then an important document known as the MSPE it stands for medical school performance evaluation and actually it holds very huge value for American medical graduates but even for in IMGs like we are, uh, we are IMGs in international medical graduates it holds value for us as well because uh, they uh, some like uh, programs tend to see how you perform it in medical school but if you have a red flag like uh, it's not actually a red flag uh, if you have a re attempts in medical school what happens is that you can actually justify it in a personal statement like what matters is that in your interview if you're able to justify why or in your personal statement why what happened like rather than finding excuses if you can see what uh, what like how did you face it and how did you overcome it and what did you do it like what did it teach you so all those things if you're able to justify it i don't think failure is an issue so it all depends on like uh, how you um, tackled it and how you presented to the uh, in your personal statement and how you perform an interview so that is what like the the biggest plus point i see in the usmla process is that if you have an issue in your scores you have an opportunity to make up for it in your cv in your personal statement on your near msp whatever it, wherever it is and in case if you don't have a good uh, like a good cv you can work uh, like you can work on the scores like if you have a good scores like that's somewhere uh, unless and until it's a very highly competitive specialty uh, you can actually find balance in all the components. Okay, very well answered. And uh, Dr. Abhilash has asked, can USMLE be subject specific? Like if someone completes MD path or MD micro, what are the pathways to go to US? Uh, so uh, the thing is that uh, like even if you're a resident, like if you're a PG student, once you go to the US, uh, you will have to uh, go through the course again. Like if you're an uh, if you're a pathologist from India, you will have to give the step one, step two, the entire process which we as resident applicant has to give, you will have to go through the same process because unfortunately they don't tend to, they don't actually uh, recognize uh, the postgraduate degrees other than the ones from the US, uh, US. So like you'll have to repeat the course. And obviously, it'll, it'll, it actually, the thing is that uh, it, it shows that it shows your dedication in that subject. So obviously, you have a better chance of matching because obviously, you'll be having field experiences regarding that subject. You will be if you're a postgraduate student, you will definitely be having some research papers with you. So all those things will help. But yeah, ultimately, you'll have to go through the same process and uh, still you will have to yeah work on your CV as well. Okay. But only that, you, only that you, you might have an added, added advantage, that's all. And there is one more thing which I wanted to mention was that, like, uh, there is a thing, like, USMLE, uh, the year of graduation also matters, like, uh, the less than three years. Within a three years of graduation, you have a higher chance of matching. Uh, so, like, the older graduate you get, you will have to provide justification. Like, for example, if you have a PG course, if you have a PG degree with you, obviously, it's justified why uh, you are, like, why you are an old graduate. So, yeah. Got it. And uh, Dr. Pirai Ganapati has asked, uh, for first aid book, 
whether student edition is enough or should we buy international edition uh the thing is that uh for first aid uh it's actually it doesn't matter much because the contents don't won't change uh like much like i said uh the important part thing is that use the latest first aid like be it international edition or uh, any other edition but use the latest first aid because it might have the latest updates in it and they might get tested on the exam so the uh, the year the edition the year of first aid is more important than the uh, international edi- like the edition i mean i meant to say that the latest first aid is more important than looking at the edition what edition it is like the 2020 or 2021 i mean sorry the international edition or the other edition okay okay our junior at times dr ratnadeep he is an usmle aspirant so he is asking us uh, if if he is applying today when will he get the date of exam uh okay so the for the usml application or when you apply for the step 1 what happens is that you will have to first uh, yeah, f- first you will have to do a passport verification for a fresh applicant you will have to do a passport verification which is done online uh, so you will get uh, an appointment with an online notary and uh, it, you will get it done in online itself so that will cost uh, around 100 120 dollars if i remember it right i don't remember the exact amount but somewhere around that range so after that you will have to Uh, so this is a part of applying for the ecfmg so basically ecfmg is education council for foreign medical graduates they are the ones which sponsor uh, international medical graduates into this U- in the, into the us medical system so you will have to get certificate uh, certified by them before applying for the match so like uh, the thing is that Uh, like i said uh, like when you apply for the usmle why are the you will have to apply by the ecfmg you will get a user id you will get a password after that once you get in uh, fill up the application form and you will have to choose an eligibility period an eligibility period in the sense like uh, it's always safe to choose an eligibility like uh, for example if you're given a, a giving an exam in december it's better to start application at least in october because like when you apply in october you will have to choose an eligibility period an eligibility period is actually a three month duration in which like you can give an exam date within that three months so you'll have to choose an exam date within that three months for example if i'm giving if i'm filling an applica- application in october and i'm choosing my eligibility period as uh november december january it actually comes as set of 3 months so you choose an eligibility period and what it does is that uh, the 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 exam centers are actually outsourced uh, to to an organization to a company known as prometric so they are the ones which carry out the step exams so like uh, you choose the eligibility period from the ecfmg and you go to the pro- uh, like after that you can book an exact appointment date from prometric website so you'll have to go to the prometric website for an exact appointment date the thing is that uh, like there is an like, there is a catch to this because like once you choose a eligibility period you can only extend it once like for example if you like i said if you applied in october and you gave a eligibility period as november december january and uh, you feel that okay you are not ready yet what you will do is that you will actually uh, you can extend your eligibility period before uh, there is a certain timeline it's given on the ecfmg website you can uh, the maximum that you can uh, stretch it is uh, january february march like adjacent three months like november december january if you're not able to give it in this uh, uh, december like yeah like did i say november december january yeah. if you're not able to give it in january you will you can choose the next adjacent three months adjacent three months as an eligibility bit it's a one time extension with a small uh, nominal fee so the thing is that like even like and in case if you're not a ready by then also then you will have to start over your application by paying uh, the entire 1200 for the exam because you'll okay. get this eligibility period only after you pay 1200 for the exam fee okay so like it's actually uh, advised to choose an exam date like because uh, like if you don't choose an exam date you you, you won't tend to have a uh, pressure to work like you will always tend to procrastinate so it's uh, what, it, when you are halfway through the uh, through the uh, preparation phase it's advisable to choose a date which will actually uh, what to say it will uh, it will motivate you to study more otherwise you will always tend to procrastinate so it's advisable to pick a date uh, once you are in half day or quarter of your preparation Okay, okay. And uh, Dr. Uh, Prashanti has asked, what is the earliest time to appear for step one? Uh, so the earliest time, like I said, like, uh, the thing is that if you apply early, it doesn't mean that you can, like it's always best to appear uh, when you're prepared. Like it's, uh, if you want to apply early, well and good. 
uh, usually people give it in second year uh, like because the first subjects tested are the pre clinical subjects so it's always advisable to give it after your second year so that is the, that is when we i think we are eligible to give and uh, i'm not actually really sure when is the uh, earliest possible time when you can give the step one but uh, what i think it is like it's basically step one tests you on first year and second year subjects so definitely after second year would be the earliest possible time if i am right okay 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 and uh, we have a lot of questions but uh, i think most of it are already answered so i'll just uh, skip to unique questions dr uh, uh, vishak has asked will we lose a uh, social lifetime i'm my, i'm a first year student and i want to know uh, if it will take a lot of time preparation for assembly will take a lot of time okay uh, so th- this is where it matters like the thing is that uh, we always tend to see this exam as something very uh, undo- non doable so we'll ha- tend to study a lot of new things from different books different resources we always tend to deviate so that is why i, uh, I was focusing on the f- uh, fact that you should have a core resource like ufap is the gold standard like anything you go outside of it it's actually it might help you but only by a couple of points like uh, if you are if you are having the potential of getting getting to uh, 240 or 250 just by doing ufap if you are going to other resources it might fetch you maybe more than like around uh, three or four points or two three points not much so it's not worth the time that you spend so like you will have to factor in the uh, you will have to consider the, uh, the 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 result and the time you put in you need to have good effect right so it's best it's best to use less less resources as possible but the ones which you can revise do revises like do portions that you can revise learn only what you can revise uh, it's there is no point in amassing knowledge when you can't revise them because revision is the key so like regarding uh, social life don't worry it won't get affected like uh, it's it's it actually takes uh, skill to uh, balance work and life and that's actually what defines a successful person like uh, it's actually good to practice from right now itself love like what i said uh, anyways like uh, you will have to manage it somehow like even later in your career when you have to do higher studies obviously you will have to work with study you will have to practice it so like i would say that don't sacrifice social life for it definitely it won't don't do it because you need social life because all work and no play makes jack a dull boy and that actually is, is true so if you are entirely into studies and no other extra curriculars obviously you will be burned out and burnout is actually real and it happens to many people make sure that you don't burn out have healthy social life have a healthy life that's what i said like have good food uh, interact with people and study as well that's what like rather than entirely going into the study mode so yeah healthy lifestyle is what you need so yeah okay thanks a lot ani for uh, all your wonderful answers i like to request dr abul hasan sir uh, if he is having some closing remarks so would you like to add anything uh yeah thank you ngadesh uh, uh, and as if uh, really it was very exciting you know the way you are uh, telling answering all questions uh, very very technical i would like to ask you one uh, political questions <laughs> that is i which i am interested now uh, what are the kind of you know opinion what is the scope for our young medical graduates from india Uh, about the opportunities in us is it uh, shrinking compared to the past or expanding compared to the past sir actually what i think is that being an indian medical student and who has uh, gone through this indian education i would uh, like from and i have interacted with many people uh, who did their education from elsewhere so uh, it is actually undeniable that we indians are very talented so like we will never uh, find short of op- short of opportunities like if we think that we need to do something we'll find a way to do it and we are everywhere so like our opportunities will never shrink because like if we are given a situation like i said we'll find a way out of it because like uh, like it's step one is pass or fail right now and many people were thinking that it's actually a uh, de- uh, closed road for imgs but imgs what they did was they like people are trying people are changing many people are working on their cv right, right from night right now itself so like uh, they are improvising people tend to improvise so like i think that uh, if we students like if we are done training from india we are actually skilled and uh, motivated enough to 
tweak according to what is needed so like we tend to adapt soon so i don't think uh, our opportunities will be shrink i think it's the other way around we might get better ex- opportunities because like uh, if we we have a lot of space to work on our cv because in india india is a land of opportunities you get a lot of opportunities to work on your cv be it volunteering services be it any um, any campaign any awareness program we have a lot of opportunities and working on the cv is the best and the easiest thing that we can do so Very our correct. opportunities only increase it will never decrease just like uh, we using this jdn platform i think yeah, uh, these uh, things of- vengadesh i think we will have to have on a program exclusively for expanding the cv you know there are so many technical points in that uh, people may not be aware of it you know how we can expand uh, many people uh, want to appear uh, approach me about getting a certificate that uh, for example i am running a imam center uh, virtually uh, i mean terminal cancer patient home uh, many people want a certificate that they uh, work there for a few days few months like that they some people would really wanted to work for the sake of getting a certificate so i think this is very important i think you, you keep it in mind we will pursue it later sure sir we can do it thank you sir and uh, moving ahead now i request uh, my mentor and the national convener of ima jdn dr shiv joshi sir to give the word of thanks thank you vankatesh um, i've been listening to the session very keenly and uh, the way uh, dr ashif uh, anif has uh, presented the content related to uh, usmle preparations as well as what to expect when we are in us and uh, if if at all we decide to join observership or what what all those uh, nitty gritties we could uh, face once we end up uh, to uh, take a decision to embark on this journey to uh, to clear usmle i also understand that it is a long process and uh, it comes with uh, its own unique pros and cons so once you are in us uh, if you clear your usmle if you can get the residency within the residency also you would have different kind of challenges of course uh, but at the same time uh, if we look at the level of opportunity that we have uh, in in a developed country like uh, united states they are definitely uh, far more uh, rewarding than the uh, than the efforts that we put in so i think everything is justified if uh, you get the the results that you were aiming for and i think that's what matters in the end uh, so thank you dr ashif uh, it was a pleasure hearing from you um, i also thank uh, dr abul hasan sir uh, our honorable chairman of ima jdn standing national standing committee uh, i see dr karan is there uh, he is the secretary for the ima jdn national council uh, thank you venkatesh for arranging and uh, being consistent in organizing the sessions uh i have practically been attending most of your sessions i mean uh, probably i would have missed one or two uh, but uh, uh, i think it has always been a pleasure to attend this uh, events uh, there's a lot to learn uh, during the sessions because uh, people who have gone through the process have lot more to share and uh, their experience teaches us uh, a lot so uh, thank you venkatesh for arranging this i also thank uh, clarnet for being the digital partner for this event um lastly but uh, of course of prime importance is that the attendees could take something valuable from this session and i'm pretty sure uh, uh, considering the number of questions that were popping up in the chat box and <laughs> considering what venkatesh has already covered uh, i'm pretty sure that uh, we were able to do justice to their expectations uh, thank you venkatesh thank you everyone for having us here thank you so much uh, sir yeah Uh, so i would also like to uh, say uh, it, it was actually actually a pleasure for me to like ex- share my journey and if it helps at least uh, a few people like if it at least helps one person on, among these people who have attended it's actually a great thing because i always feel that if i had such an uh, session like if i had to get if i got to attend any of the sessions like this which is uh, which has just which has happened right now it would have been uh, it would have meant a lot for me at that time and it would have made a difference so i feel that now since we have people who are actually pro- uh, making such informative sessions to people and i think it's actually a great initiative by the ima and jdn and uh, i really appreciate appreciate your efforts and i really uh, look forward to be a part of this team again and thank you so much for having me 
thank you so much dr anish once again i would like to thank you dr abul sir dr shiv sir and dr karan uh, who is not uh, able to join uh, uh, due to some uh, technical issues and all other participants for making this webinar a great success thanks a lot everyone we are closing now thank you thank you so much sir we are closing